It feels like birthday season over on Patreon. I got a bunch of July birthday patrons. I want to say a very happy birthday to Leah, Megan, Nassim, Florencia, Elaine, Jane, Vanessa, Carrie, Layla, Regina, Yulia, Cody, Sarah, and Melissa. I hope you're having a wonderful birthday month. Maybe you're sneaking a vacation in there, which I fully endorse. Go ahead, eat some cake for me, maybe some pie since it is summer here in America. And I want to just say a very big happy birthday. When two teens tried to scare a third, everyone thought it was just a teenage melodrama. The parents tried to scare the kids out of their feud, but little did they know that the plotting continued. I'm Charlie and welcome to Crime Lines. Welcome to Crime Lines. We are halfway through the summer break here in the U.S. with my kids all at home, and I haven't had to take an unscheduled week off just yet, so I'm considering that a win. We'll see how August goes as I am going out of town for a family vacation, but I am also going to be at the True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival in late August in Austin, Texas. There is more information in the show notes on how to get tickets, You will be able to find me not just at my table in the podcast gallery area where we can talk about cases, you can grab some stickers, we can hang out. I will also be doing some panels. So if you come to that, you'll actually probably be sick of hearing from me by the end of the weekend. Again, more info in the show notes. Today's case that we're going to cover was recommended to me by Caitlin, and I decided to go ahead and cover it after I read The Ghosts That Haunt Me, which is a memoir by a Toronto police investigator named Steve Ryan. In his book, he covers a handful of notable career cases, and this was the one that stuck with me the most. With every case I cover, I ask myself, why am I covering it? Am I bringing anything new to the conversation, or are we exploring an issue? Maybe we're learning about some historic event or legal principle. With this one, I think the issue I'm exploring is one that I've been thinking about already, and it's probably why this case stuck with me when I recently read about it. As many of you know, I have several children. I have two in their 20s, two who are still teenagers, and two who are yet to be teenagers. It probably goes without saying that I've spent many years thinking about warning signs, points of intervention, how much privacy to give, how much trust to give, who they're hanging out with, what they're doing, where they're going, safety plans, exit strategies, social media monitoring, and the list goes on and on. And it makes me miss the days when I worried how to teach them how to share and how I was going to wean them off a pacifier. Those were definitely the simpler days. Now, for my higher tier Patreons this last month, I covered the case of Miranda Peter. In that case, we were dealing with teenagers who had experienced trauma in their lives, and we could see how the impact of generational trauma and abuse led to tragic results. There were multiple signs and moments that things were off course, and there could have been intervention on all sides. It's an easy case to look at and say, as a parent, look for these signs. But what happens when there is a tragic event involving teenagers and they didn't have all those signs? How much harder is it to figure out prevention when it's not something you see coming? So maybe the lesson we are going to walk away with today is that we as parents cannot control everything. We cannot prevent everything, and we cannot protect them from everything. Maybe we need to learn to extend that grace to other parents whose children do wrong or possibly have wrong done to them, and maybe we need to give that grace to ourselves. Or maybe we will learn about more subtle signs, like a relationship we think is too intense for teenagers to be in. I'm not saying you have to be a parent to get something out of this episode, but being a parent is why I wanted to cover the case, if that makes sense. 
I don't know that I've ever given an intro that long, so let's go ahead and get into it. This case takes place in Toronto in the East York area. Stephanie Wrangell grew up there, which is a pretty perfect area since her cousins also lived in the neighborhood and she and her siblings had plenty of family around. Stephanie lived primarily with her mother Patricia, her stepfather James, and her younger brothers. Her father Adolfo lived nearby, having split from Patricia when Stephanie was six. Both homes were safe places for Stephanie, and she definitely grew up with structure and love and rules. But I think that's probably par for the course since she was in a family of law enforcement. Her father was a court officer for the Toronto Police Service, and her mother and stepfather were both police officers. So yes, rules and boundaries were set and enforced. But Stephanie still had room to spread her wings. She was very creative, always changing her hair color or styling clothes she picked up at a secondhand store. She wrote poetry and she loved music. She was active in church, so she loved Christian rock, but she also loved Latin music, which she got into thanks to her father, who was from Venezuela. One thing her parents did was monitor her social media and internet usage. They knew early on how the World Wide Web was introducing a lot of complications into kids' lives whether it was information they weren't ready for or interactions with a stranger who may be a catfish or cyberbullying, they were going to keep an eye on it. My sixth episode of this podcast way back in 2019 was about Carly Ryan, an Australian teenager who was catfished off the internet and murdered in 2007. Her mom has since worked hard to teach internet literacy and safety And this was the same time period we're talking about here, from 2005 to about 2008. Stephanie's mom had all the passwords to all of Stephanie's accounts and would spot check her messages. So in 2005, when Stephanie was 12 years old and started quote unquote dating 15 year old David Bagshaw, her parents had all eyes on the situation. This dating relationship was mostly just hanging out at a park together and messaging each other. The closest thing to a traditional date would be lunch at a local pizza place. After all, Stephanie was only 12. One day, David called the house and left a voicemail for Stephanie. Right on the family's phone line, he left a message talking about oral sex. Not that the couple had done it, but that it was something he wanted, and reportedly, it sounded like he was trying to pressure Stephanie into something she was not ready for. This was clearly beyond the walking to the park, holding hands type of relationship that her parents approved of at her age, so they made Stephanie break things off with David. She was a bit upset at first, looking at this as her parents expressing a lack of trust in her, which is a pretty typical response from someone her age who doesn't have the experience to know that we can trust ourselves, we can trust our children, but we can't trust everyone around us. But Stephanie did as her parents requested and broke things off with David and moved on. The relationship had only lasted a few weeks, so it didn't take her long to get over it. Fast forward to the fall of 2007. This is two years later. Stephanie was 14 and David was 17. Stephanie started building a new friend group after she was admitted to the local arts high school, focusing on theater. With these new friends, a kid like David, who was three years older than her and in and out of trouble, wasn't really someone on her radar anymore, except here and there. It was in late October 2007 that David made his presence in Stephanie's life known again. Stephanie was home with her family when she got a call from David to come outside and talk. Stephanie slipped on her shoes and went outside to find David standing there holding a knife. David told her that his new girlfriend, 15-year-old Melissa Todorovic, had told him to kill Stephanie. He said he didn't want to, 
So he told Stephanie what he was going to do was to leave his phone behind. When Melissa called, Stephanie was to answer the phone and tell her that David had tried but failed to kill her, and he had dropped his phone in the process. That way, Melissa would stop bugging him to kill Stephanie. At that point, David dropped his phone on the ground and left. To say Stephanie was disturbed by this conversation would be understating things. She did the right thing, though, and immediately went to her mom and told her what happened. It seemed so odd that Stephanie had dated David for a few weeks, two full years before, but somehow David and Melissa now had a problem with her. It did seem out of the blue, but apparently there were rumors going around that David cheated on Melissa. And those rumors, from what I understand, were probably true. Stephanie had heard them, and she had also seen him flirting with other girls, including herself. And she mentioned this to Melissa's cousin. Melissa's cousin then told Melissa, who was hurt and embarrassed. Instead of seeing this as a problem with David's loyalty entirely, she jumped on it as an excuse to be angry with Stephanie for gossiping. And there's a reason I'm calling it an excuse. The truth was Melissa already had a deep-rooted issue that she directed towards Stephanie beyond just this teenage spat. Before Stephanie had ever talked to Melissa's cousin, David made a comment to Melissa once that he thought Stephanie was pretty. And Melissa, who did not know Stephanie, looked her up on social media. Melissa was deeply insecure about her own physical appearance and Stephanie's looks, happiness, and confidence, as seen through her Facebook, felt almost like a personal attack to someone like Melissa. She saw Stephanie as a rival for David's interest, and even though Stephanie had no interest in David, Melissa told David she needed Stephanie to be dead. When this incident happened and Stephanie went to her mom about it, we need to remember that her mom, Patricia, was not just a mom. She was also a police officer. So she had the double authority when she reached out to both Melissa and David. And both of them tried to initially pass it off as just trying to scare Stephanie. Neither of them actually wanted her killed. When Patricia had talked to Melissa specifically over the phone, she was surprised by Melissa's response. She expected Melissa to be quick to back down when she was told to leave Stephanie alone. But instead, Melissa said, Stephanie has to stop spreading rumors about me. As though Stephanie supposedly spreading a rumor was on par with Melissa's response of sending David over there with a knife. Patricia told her in no uncertain terms to stop contacting Stephanie or they would get a restraining order. Patricia also went over to David's house to return his phone, not to him, but to his mother. Mother to mother, she asked for help just keeping David away from Stephanie. After hearing what happened between the two that night, David and his mom agreed he would stay away. And based on what we learn in later reports, David's mother would have probably been happy to keep David away from Melissa as well, if she could have. And Melissa's family were in agreement. It seemed no one thought David and Melissa's relationship was a good idea, except for them. The two had met at their high school, and they started dating seven months before the incident with Stephanie, which puts that in about March of 2007. They were a bit of an odd couple, with Melissa being a bookish student taking advanced classes, whereas David was at risk for not graduating due to truancy, poor grades, and repeated suspensions due to aggression and fighting. Melissa was close to her parents, particularly her mother, and she was seen by those around her as a kind and considerate child. But when she started dating, the family saw some issues. She did not handle breakups well at all, self-harming after one of them, and also threatening the new girlfriend of an ex, even after she started seeing David. Melissa was just as possessive with David as she had been with her exes, and his family could see it. David's father ended up 
banning her from their house after he found out that she put spyware on David's computer to keep an eye on what he was doing online and who he was talking to. She was also very rude to David's mother, leaving her nasty notes, and she wasn't particularly welcome at David's mother's house either. But before I inadvertently paint David as the victim in this relationship, I do want to be clear that David was not a good boyfriend either. Melissa's parents also hoped the relationship would end, even trying to intervene and convince her to end things, particularly after her cousin had told her what Stephanie had said. David had also at least once hit Melissa, though I'm not sure her parents knew about that. Melissa had confided some of her insecurities in her mom and wondered out loud who would want to date someone with braces and glasses when there were so many pretty girls at school. It sounded like any boyfriend was better than no boyfriend in her mind. In spite of both sets of parents disapproving of this relationship, both before and after Patricia warned them to leave Stephanie alone, Melissa and David continued seeing each other. But they seemed, on the surface, to have done as Patricia requested and let Stephanie be, so no further action had to be taken. Behind the scenes, however, was a totally different story. Melissa and David continued to communicate about Stephanie, not to Stephanie, but rather they talked about her between themselves, and she had no idea that Melissa's obsession and jealousy only became worse than ever over the next two months. On New Year's Day, Stephanie was home with her younger brother while her mother and stepfather were visiting an older relative. Her brother was eating dinner when Stephanie's phone rang. It was 6.08 p.m. The number the call was coming from was blocked, but Stephanie answered it anyway. The voice on the other line said something about, meet me outside. And Stephanie heard the voice and thought she recognized it. She told her brother she would be right back. She was heading outside to talk to Steve. Steve was a boy Stephanie had dated and broken up with in November. It sounds like that is who Stephanie thought was calling. Moments later, a 34-year-old man named Gavin was driving home down the same street Stephanie lived on. It had been snowy for a bit, so he was going slow to avoid any slick spots. He saw someone standing on the sidewalk, and then that person fell over. He assumed she had slipped. When he didn't see her get back up, he pulled over to check on her and make sure she was okay. And Gavin found 14-year-old Stephanie Wrangel holding her stomach and saying, it hurts, as blood was coming from her abdomen. Gavin hadn't seen what happened to her because Stephanie had been attacked before he was on the street. She had been trying to get herself home and had made it several feet before collapsing. The attacker was gone before Gavin even got to the scene. He called 911, of course, and while on the 911 call, Gavin asked Stephanie who did this. Clinging to consciousness, she said, Bags did it and pointed down the street in the direction her attacker had run off. This recording is heartbreaking because we know these were Stephanie's last words. Gavin stayed with her, trying to reassure her as they waited on the paramedics, and I imagine those were the longest minutes of his life. An ambulance arrived and whisked Stephanie off to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. At the time, first responders didn't know who the victim was, so her family was not immediately contacted. Instead, Stephanie's brother called his mom Patricia upset, saying something had happened in the neighborhood and Stephanie wasn't home with him. Patricia tried to call Stephanie a few times, but she did not answer. That was unusual since Stephanie was good about answering when her parents called. The rule was one that most parents, including me, have. If Stephanie wanted her parents to pay for her phone, she better answer it when they called. 
So as her mom and stepdad were making their way home as quickly as they could and couldn't reach Stephanie, they were getting nervous. When they pulled up, Patricia immediately asked what was going on. The street was blocked off, but it didn't escape her attention that the police were at her driveway. She told them that she couldn't reach her daughter and the officer asked for a description. When Patricia said that Stephanie was 14, the officer said that the victim was in her 20s. While this might have been reassuring for some, it was not for Patricia because she knew Stephanie could sometimes be mistaken for older than she was. The officer told them where the victim had been transported, so Patricia immediately headed to the hospital where they were able to identify Stephanie's body. She had been stabbed six times with an eight-inch kitchen knife. Patricia didn't need to be told what Stephanie had said in her last words to let them know that David Bagshaw was the one who did this. Bags was a nickname of his. But she told them they couldn't just stop with David. She told them all about the October incident, and they needed to look at his girlfriend as well. So the police set out that night to find David Bagshaw as quickly as possible, but he hadn't gone home. Instead, he had gone to a friend's house, a friend whose mother called the police. What happened was that David texted his friend Stephen just after 7 p.m. Stephen is not the same Steve that Stephanie had previously dated. These are two different people. David asked to come over to Stephen's house, and he said sure. When David got there, Stephen noticed that David's jacket looked wet. They went up to Stephen's room, and Stephen overheard two phone calls David got from his girlfriend, Melissa. In one of them, Stephen could hear Melissa say, Did you do it? Stephen did not have to guess on what this was about because David outright told him, I killed Stephanie. And he said he needed somewhere to hide his jacket. That's when Stephen realized the jacket was wet, not with water but with blood. Not sure what to do and eager to get David out of his house, Stephen said he could hide it in the backyard. David went downstairs and Stephen watched from his window as David buried the jacket in the snow. Stephen then went downstairs and locked the front door so David could not come back in, and he went to tell his mom what just happened. She was watching TV in the other room, hearing the coming and going of teenagers, which wasn't unusual. But when Stephen told her what was actually going on, she called 911 to report it. The police went out to the house and spoke with Stephen and his mom, and they retrieved the bloody coat from the backyard. The investigators were still looking for David, though, at this point, and they were also looking for his girlfriend. They had initially found the wrong person who they thought was his girlfriend, but at 2 a.m., they made it to the right person, Melissa Todorovic. She agreed to go to the station for questioning, and seeing as she was just 15 years old, her mother went with her. Initially, when the investigators looked at Melissa, they were just intending to interview her about David as a potential witness. They didn't really suspect she had any direct involvement. She was small, quiet, and according to Steve Ryan's memoir, mousy-looking. Certainly didn't look like someone involved in a murder plot. As they talked to Melissa, she was seemingly forthcoming, admitting to the October incident, but saying that David never planned to kill Stephanie. He just went there to scare her to get her to stop talking badly about him. Her telling David to kill Stephanie was, according to Melissa, just them joking around. They asked Melissa if they had David in front of them. Would he tell them that Melissa had told him to kill Stephanie, just like back in October? And she said, probably. They asked her if he would say that because it was true, and she nodded in agreement. Melissa's mother was shocked and asked if she knew what she was saying. And Melissa said yes and said she told her mother back in October that she had asked David to do it. At this point, it was starting to sound a lot like an admission of involvement. In Canada, juvenile offenders have a lot of rights to protect them from interrogations, seeing as they are more vulnerable to false confessions, more vulnerable than adults, for sure. 
So the interview was immediately terminated while Melissa was given the chance to speak to an attorney. She was put in a holding cell until that could happen. Meanwhile, search warrants were obtained for both Melissa's home and David's, and all their electronics like computers and phones. When the police were at David's house, his mom told them that anything he was involved with was connected to Melissa and that they had banned her from their home. She wanted it on the record that Melissa was bad news. David never did make it home that night. He was found by police in the wee morning hours roaming around in the cold. He had nowhere to go, and he was taken into custody without issue. He was just days away from his 18th birthday. Melissa, also still in custody at this point, spoke to an attorney, and the investigators advised her in depth of her rights at around 7 a.m., That included her right to her attorney and her right to have someone with her for further questioning. Melissa declined the attorney, but she said she wanted her mom there. When her mom arrived back at the station, she talked to Melissa alone for about 20 minutes. She told Melissa she should not talk to the police without a lawyer, but no matter how much her mom tried to encourage her to have an attorney there, Melissa turned it down. While she was a minor and was given extra leeway and ample opportunity to exercise her rights, the ultimate decision was still hers. So she was interviewed without an attorney. And this interview started at 8.15 in the morning. Melissa and her mother sat together as the police now questioned Melissa not as a witness, but as a suspect who was being detained. So the tone of the entire interaction had shifted from the first interview. Initially, Melissa just admitted that there was a, quote, general feeling between her and David that she didn't like Stephanie and wanted her dead. As she walked through specific conversations she had with David in regards to this, she admitted that David had called her prior to the murder and said he was going to Stephanie's with a knife. She claimed her response was basically, do what you want. She didn't try to talk him out of it, but she also didn't tell him to kill Stephanie. But the more the investigators were talking to Melissa, the more she revealed, like how she had threatened at one point to break up with David if Stephanie was still alive. She also told them that David had actually gone to Stephanie's house the day before, New Year's Eve, But Stephanie's family was around, and he didn't think he could lure her out. That's why he went back the next day while her parents weren't home. Melissa also told the police that she spoke to and saw David after the murder, and he said that he threw the murder weapon into a backyard as he fled Stephanie's neighborhood on foot. The yards were covered with snow, but thanks to this tip of where to look and some warming temperatures melting some of that snow, It only took about an hour of searching for investigators to find the murder weapon. Melissa ended up giving the police quite a bit piece by piece in this interview, but what she didn't give them was any signs she had any remorse for what happened. Quite the opposite. It didn't bother her at all that a girl had been killed. Now, even with everything Melissa said, she still held back her full role in what happened. That wouldn't be exposed until the police pulled the text messages between Melissa and David. Remember, they started dating in March of 2007. The first time Stephanie was brought up in their texts and online messages was May of that year. Melissa messaged David one day, accusing him of talking to Stephanie and threatening to stab her. Soon after, David messaged Melissa, offering to give her the knife but she said she already had one. Over the next several months, a revenge fantasy played out in these messages between the two. Mind you, this was before Stephanie ever said anything to Melissa's cousin about David flirting or cheating. These scenarios they plotted out were sick. One conversation talked about kidnapping Stephanie and killing her in an isolated area. In another, Melissa fantasized about mutilating Stephanie before throwing her off a balcony. She also wondered if she could talk her brother into sexually assaulting Stephanie first. 
Eventually, through these messages, Melissa said she realized she couldn't kill Stephanie herself. She didn't care if someone else killed Stephanie, but she didn't want to do it. And that's when it turned into her telling David to kill Stephanie. These texts and online messages were truly disturbing, but I don't think you can fully understand that if you don't know that many were punctuated with LOL. For instance, shortly before David showed up at Stephanie's house in October, Melissa texted, I want her dead, lol. After the failed October incident and the warning from Patricia, Melissa wasted little time in getting back into planning mode, this time mentioning possibly using a gun. But as David dragged his feet and put off the attack on Stephanie, Melissa would hold something over his head. Like when David mentioned he would kill Stephanie towards the end of the school semester when he would have a car to use as a getaway, Melissa replied, that was fine, but no sex until it happened. Other times she would threaten to break up with him, start dating someone else. And then in mid-December, Melissa warned him that she was blocking his messages until he killed Stephanie. Melissa told him that he needed to do it before he turned 18. Because if he got caught, the courts would go lighter on him if he was a minor, and his birthday was just a few days into January. So, so much for Melissa's statement to the police that she didn't care one way or the other if David killed Stephanie, and that she didn't really push him into it. The police found dozens of calls and texts between the two in the hours leading up to the murder and immediately after. From what the police could piece together, Melissa and David were on the phone just moments before he ambushed Stephanie and stabbed her to death. Not that he had to ambush her. He was nearly six feet tall and well over 200 pounds. He could have easily overpowered her. Add in a surprise attack and she certainly didn't stand a chance. To show, again, how truly cold this was on Melissa's part, according to her phone records, During the time she knew David was going to kill Stephanie, she texted her mom and asked if she would buy her a green tea latte. Also, according to phone records, 15 minutes after the stabbing, Melissa called Stephanie's phone. The two had never met or spoke before this. This was the one and only call Melissa had ever made to Stephanie. And it turned out it was to make sure the call went to voicemail as confirmation Stephanie was dead. After David had taken off out of the neighborhood, tossing the knife away and going to Steve's house to bury his coat, he called Melissa, and he told her that Stephanie was dead and she asked him to come over. Based on statements to the police, David showed up at her house, and at her request, he reenacted the murder. The two then had sex before David left. The murder occurred a bit after 6 p.m., but Melissa wasn't picked up by the police until 2 a.m., so she was still home when word started spreading among the teens in the area that there had been a murder and that the victim was Stephanie. According to Melissa's chat logs, a friend immediately reached out to ask if she heard the news and even asked if Melissa was worried she would be suspected in the crime. Melissa didn't seem worried in her response, saying that only David and this friend she was messaging with knew that she wanted Stephanie dead. No one else knew to implicate her. She told the friend that she and David were not involved, but that they did have sex that night. And then she ended the sentence with LOL, her favorite punctuation. When considering the list of people who knew she wanted Stephanie dead, she seemed to have forgotten that Stephanie's parents also knew about this because of that October incident. Of course, neither Melissa nor David thought Stephanie would have been alive long enough to identify her attacker, let alone have it recorded on the 911 call, which only further sealed their fate. The investigators knew that David was the one who wielded the knife and he was charged with first-degree murder. 
Proving Melissa was the mastermind behind the murder would be a bit harder, but they had all of those messages when she went to trial on a first-degree murder charge in March 2009. The Crown's theory was that Melissa had ordered David to kill Stephanie, and she enticed him not with money, but through a different type of payment. She was threatening to withhold sex and or break up with him if he didn't do it. The theory isn't entirely dissimilar from the 2014 case of Conrad Roy, except in that case, the person Conrad killed was himself. But a court found that his girlfriend, Michelle Carter, had encouraged him to do so over text. She was tried and convicted of involuntary manslaughter in that case. But the Crown here was hoping to prove first-degree murder. No, Melissa did not pay David money to kill Stephanie. She didn't give him the knife, drive him over there, or otherwise participate in a hands-on way. But the phone and chat records showed that she prodded him and enticed him to carry it out. They had 30,000 pages of message transcripts to show exactly what was said and how it was said. Melissa had a top-notch defense attorney who argued that Melissa didn't really want David to kill Stephanie. It was just talk, and she couldn't control how David took her messages. It was really David who chose to kill Stephanie. He was the older one in the couple, and he had a violent history, which included assaulting his mother when he was 14. The charge was eventually dropped after he took anger management classes. Melissa did not have a history like that, and she was young, just 15 at the time, and her attorney argued she couldn't foresee that David would take her seriously. The trial lasted three weeks, and the jury deliberated for a long time, 20 hours, before coming to a verdict. While it may seem somewhat straightforward when you see how much Melissa was messaging and texting David up to and after the murder, there were factors to consider, like her age and her state of mind. In the end, they found that Melissa was just as culpable as if she held the knife herself and found her guilty of first-degree murder. Then we move on to sentencing, where Melissa's background really came into play. This is where we would normally hear about mitigating factors like childhood trauma and mental illness. But Melissa's background was squeaky clean. She was insecure, sure, but that's not unusual for a teenager coming into their own. She grew up in a home with nurturing and loving parents. She had nice things, including family vacations to the Caribbean and regular activities. Her school performance involved straight A's and excellent behavior. Melissa seemed to be the least at risk of committing a violent crime. But then they had her evaluated by two psychiatrists, and one of them compared her to fatal attraction, particularly Glenn Close's character. It was determined that Melissa had both obsessive-compulsive and borderline personality disorders. She had a capacity to manipulate, and she lacked empathy and remorse. Though her background didn't necessarily throw up a ton of red flags, she was at risk of becoming an offender as she admitted she had ongoing thoughts about hurting others. Melissa made a statement at sentencing saying she took full responsibility for her part in what happened, which the judge did not believe. He called her the puppet master and said that he didn't believe she was accepting her full role, and it's easy why he saw things that way. Melissa's entire defense was that she wasn't as culpable as David was. A guilty verdict didn't flip the switch and suddenly Melissa fully accepted her responsibility. The judge commented that the puppet master may even be more culpable than the puppet since they put the wheels in motion. In short, if not for Melissa, David would not have killed Stephanie. And that's a big part of why the judge decided to sentence Melissa not as a juvenile, but as an adult. The issue really came down to supervision. As a juvenile, her maximum sentence in prison was six years, followed by four years of probation. After that, she would be free of supervision and the record would be sealed. With an adult sentence, it would be a life sentence. Melissa would be eligible for release at seven years, so she may not spend much more time incarcerated, but it was the supervision afterwards that the judge wanted in place for the safety of the community. 
Two months after Melissa's trial and sentencing, David pleaded guilty to first-degree murder, in part to spare Stephanie's family the pain of another trial. His attorney said David was less concerned about what would happen to him than he was about the pain he had caused. According to the Toronto Life article, The Last Days of Stephanie Rangel by Marina Jimenez, which was a major source for this episode, there was a big difference between how Melissa and David presented in court. Melissa read a prepared statement at sentencing, didn't look at Stephanie's family, and stayed mostly quiet and calm during the entire thing. David, on the other hand, cried off and on through most of it, and when he made his statement, he turned to face Stephanie's family. He apologized for killing Stephanie, who he said deserved to live, and he said he would not forgive himself. The judge believed David's remorse was sincere, yet it didn't change the fact that he had carried out Melissa's orders. He had other options. He could have called the police, he could have broken up with Melissa, he could have done a hundred things that ended with Stephanie being left alone. David was sentenced as an adult to life in prison with no parole for 10 years. He appealed the sentence, arguing he should have been sentenced as a juvenile, seeing as he was 17 when the murder occurred, and his psychological testing showed he was very immature for his age. But the appellate court did not find this argument persuasive. Melissa also appealed, largely based on the admission of her statements to the police. But thanks to the investigators making sure they followed the law to the letter, when it came to interviewing a juvenile, she really had no argument here, and it was denied. And then things did not settle down, even with David and Melissa behind bars. In March of 2011, 21-year-old David Bagshaw, another inmate named Jordan Trudeau, and a third inmate got into an altercation. According to the Kingston Whig Standard, David and Jordan were stabbing the third man. The guards shot both David and Jordan after attempting other methods of stopping the assault. David was injured, but he recovered while Jordan was shot dead. The man being stabbed also recovered, and David was charged with attempted murder. At the time, he was trying to get moved out of a maximum security prison, and as you can imagine, this dashed those hopes. When the investigation was completed, it seemed that Jordan had been the primary aggressor and that David had been involved in a lesser way. The attempted murder charge was downgraded to assault with a deadly weapon and assault causing bodily harm. A two and a half year sentence was ordered to be served concurrently to his 10 to life sentence. In 2017, Melissa earned the right to have short outings into the community while incarcerated. At the hearing applying for this type of day parole, Melissa still insisted that she never expected David to kill Stephanie and offered up as proof that she had actually asked him to kill two other girls she was jealous of, but he didn't do that. How was she to know he would do it this time? But Melissa did admit she manipulated him and took some responsibility for that. Three times over the next year, Melissa was allowed out for three days each time, and she started working outside the jail, meaning she was allowed to go to work and then be returned to the jail after. All of this went well, and in late 2018, when she was 26 years old, Melissa was granted full day parole for six months. She was to live in a halfway house as she integrated into the community, and it was a big step towards full parole. She had been in custody since her arrest in early 2009. Stephanie's family objected to the day parole being granted, with Stephanie's mother saying in her victim impact statement that she didn't see a changed person in Melissa. She saw someone who had only become more cunning, and the only empathy she had was for herself. It does seem odd that the parole board granted full-time day parole given that Melissa lied at the hearing. She claimed she had met Stephanie before the murder, but at trial, it was established they had never met. And she denied she rewarded David for murder by having sex with him that same night, but that did happen. Additionally, Melissa said she had changed from the time of the murder in that she realized that David wouldn't have killed Stephanie if not for her but she still said she didn't think he would do it. However, she would accept responsibility. But reportedly, her affect was flat during this portion of the hearing, and the only time she did get emotional 
was when she was asked about her own insecurities and body image issues, which made it sound like she was only upset on her own behalf. Even one of the two members of the parole board told Melissa she didn't do well at the hearing, yet they still granted the day parole, and Melissa immediately moved into a halfway house in Brampton, which was about an hour from Stephanie's family home. Stephanie's family knew this was part of the process, and it gave them some time to prepare for what seemed to be inevitable at the time, that Melissa would be given full parole at the end of the six months. Day parole, like what Melissa was granted, includes some strict rules, and one of those was that she had to disclose any romantic relationships. She could have them, she just had to report them because of the role of a toxic relationship on the crime she committed. But Melissa opted not to comply. In March of 2019, after just four months of day parole, it was determined Melissa was not in one but two intimate relationships that she didn't disclose. One was with a man she had either met at the halfway house or through some program she was participating in, and the other man was his friend. But it wasn't just the hidden relationships. There was an accusation that she was pitting the men against each other. Her day parole was then revoked as it was determined she was engaging in her, quote, offense cycle by using a sexual relationship to manipulate a partner. That was literally what happened when Stephanie was murdered. Melissa asked for them to reconsider, which they did, and still ruled that she was not ready for day parole and she was to stay in prison. In 2021, David Bagshaw applied for parole, but it was denied. They acknowledged the work he had done to deal with his anger and impulsivity, including being compliant with his medication, but he was still too at risk of reoffense at that time. The hearing gave David hope that he was on the path to eventual release, but he wasn't there just yet. David himself expressed that he wanted the chance to prove himself, but he didn't know that he warranted release at that time. Like he did at sentencing, he expressed remorse for what he did. He is allowed to apply every two years, so the next opportunity will be later this year. As of this recording, both Melissa and David are still in prison as far as I can tell, though both are eligible to continue to seek parole. And so that leaves us to think about what we can learn from this case, this case where we have three teenagers who didn't show significant signs they were headed towards a violent altercation. For victimology, Stephanie was low risk. Her mother, father, and step-parents were all involved in her life. Her parents at both homes monitored her social media and computer usage. The family computer even had a keystroke monitoring program, and there would be spot checks on all communications. There were no warning signs that they saw that she was involved in this love triangle because, frankly, she wasn't involved. The entire thing was in the heads and private messages of Melissa and David. Even the October incident looked like a teenage melodrama playing out on Stephanie's front lawn and not a serious attempt on her life. When no one bothered Stephanie after, the family thought it was settled. Stephanie had no idea it was still going on. She and David had been broken up 24 times longer than they were ever together. So if this entire thing happened in a world only David and Melissa lived in, then we have to look at them and their backgrounds. We know David did have a history of aggression. He had assaulted his mother once. He was a known bully. And he spent some time in a group home when he was 15. His childhood wasn't perfect. His parents split up and he moved between their homes. His mother was rather ill with heart disease for several years of his childhood, which is hard on a kid. She ended up dying shortly after his arrest. David was also diagnosed with ADHD at a young age and treatment was inconsistent. But if we're honestly looking at risk factors for a murder, none of this really adds up to obvious signs. David needed more help than he was getting, but that's true for a lot of teenagers. And it's believed David wouldn't have killed if not for Melissa. For all of his bluster, David was an easily manipulated person, and that continued in prison with the assault of the other inmate. So let's look at Melissa. We are certainly not going to solve the mystery of Melissa Todorovic today. 
This is someone who functioned normally in all aspects of her life, but as soon as it came to an intimate partner, she showed antisocial tendencies that she didn't show in other areas. She threatened people, she stalked them by trying to monitor them, she tried to manipulate them into proving how much they loved her, she self-harmed. Lots of warning factors there. Due to this behavior, the people who are at the greatest risk if Melissa would reoffend would be intimate partners and any children she might have. That's not to say she's at a high risk of reoffense. Even the experts couldn't accurately assess her risk factor, particularly given her young age at the time the murder happened. Perhaps with intensive counseling, she can learn to have a non-toxic relationship. So far, with that one attempt at day parole, that didn't happen, but that's not to say it never will. The real change we've seen out of this case was with Stephanie's mother, Patricia. After she managed to work through the darkest parts of losing a child, thanks to family support and therapy, she trained to become a grief coach. She helped teach police officers how to work with the families of victims, informing them of the little things you don't really understand until you're in that position. And she began working directly with victims' families. And then, when they were ready, Patricia and her husband James then opened their home and their hearts again and adopted two little girls. The love they had for Stephanie never faded, and it only expanded Patricia's work and their family. Thank you for listening. You can find Crimelines on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and occasionally TikTok. Crimelines is on Patreon, where I offer early and ad-free episodes, as well as bonus content. Visit patreon.com slash crimelines. If you want to buy me a coffee, the official drink of Crimelines, you can give a one-time donation at basementfortproductions.com slash support. And if you need a palate cleanser after listening to heavier true crime shows, check out Rusty Hinges, an allegedly funny history, mystery, and true crime show that I co-created and write for.